Good morning, Summit Community Church. We have turned the page of 2020. Brand new year, 2021, our first Sunday of the year. We're so glad to have you with us to worship together our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to kick off this year in a grand way, a big way to show Him that He is supreme in our lives. So let's spend time today worshiping Him, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, through song and through His Word.
jealous for me love's like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy when all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. And oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us. Yeah. 
For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit.
morning and Happy New Year. Welcome to the first Sunday of 2021. I don't know if you're like me, but in so many ways, I was so ready to turn the page on 2020. I was so ready to finish that chapter and begin a whole new chapter, if not an entirely new book, for 2021. But while a lot of 2020 has been circumstances we want to put behind us, this past year has also shown us some things. Probably one of the tragedies for me personally, and probably for most of you, is the difficulties of 2020 didn't reveal anything new about us. They just simply exposed for us what we already were. Now, some of those things were good, and some were not so good. When we entered 2020 in January, we never imagined all that would happen throughout the year. Now, as we're beginning 2021, we really don't know what will happen this year. But as we began the year, we want to dig deep into some of the most basic disciplines of our faith to better understand them and better understand ourselves in light of those disciplines. In the book of Isaiah, God gives us the perfect word picture of what we're to be in Him. In Isaiah chapter 6, God gives us the imagery of an oak tree. He calls us oaks of righteousness. In Isaiah 6 verse 3, he says this, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Now, why is an oak tree tall and strong? The answer is longevity. Oak trees are powerful and majestic because they have weathered years and years of withering sun, gusting winds, and bitter cold. Year by year, season by season, they grow in strength. Year by year, season by season, they send their roots deeper and deeper into the nutrients of the soil until they're virtually unmovable. You see, it takes dense wood, hard bark, and deep roots to weather the harsh conditions that an oak tree must weather to be around for generations. But it does take generations for the wood, the bark, and the roots to grow. Right around the base of an oak tree, you'll find and there are more shadows the opposite of this. In the shadows of an oak tree, you will find mushrooms. Now, their characteristics are polar opposite of the oak tree that they briefly look up to. Mushrooms grow up overnight and are quickly gone. They aren't strong. They don't have deep roots. You can reach down and flick one over with your finger. See, for us, big, rapid, short-lived growth is not what God is after for us. That's why God chose the oak tree and not the mushroom for his word picture of what he wants us to be. God is after oak trees, long-term spiritual maturity, not just for our eternal good, but also for the never-ending display of his glory. Now, the the graphic we're using for our new series, Rooted, has a very special meaning for many of us. This tree you see in our graphic is on the property of where we partnered for many years at Hope of Guatemala in Guatemala City. One afternoon, this very tree caught my eye. I saw how over time it had worked its way over and around a rock wall to get its roots down to the soil to continue growing. You see, God made that tree, as he does all trees, to be able to conquer and overcome. Just like this tree and that rock wall, we face obstacles. But God equips us with the ability to stay alive and even keep growing. You see, by being rooted in Christ, he enables us and equips us to overcome and persevere. We must show determination and dedication to being rooted in him so we can grow into the oaks of righteousness he wants us to be so we can glorify him with our very lives. Each week in our new series, Rooted, We're going to look at an element of our faith that we need to have a deeper understanding of and need to dig deeper into so we can be rooted and become an oak of righteousness, glorify Him. What we're looking at today is what I would call the taproot of being rooted in Christ. You see, a taproot is a large, central, dominant root that all the other roots sprout laterally from. The gospel is that taproot where everything else in life, and specifically all the things we need to be rooted in Him in the coming days and coming weeks we'll talk about come from. Today we're going to talk about the gospel. 
When we hear the word gospel, we typically think of evangelism. The gospel being the basics of salvation. We think of that as being what brings us to Christ and nothing more. The word gospel means good news. It is a combination of words in the Greek that are the words good and angel or herald. It's also where we get our word evangelist from. See, back in the first century, there was no news media. There was no 30 Rock, NBC, CBS, ABC. There was no social media. No tweets on Twitter. No pics on Instagram. No ticks or talks on TikTok. No faces on Facebook. None of that. So to spread the news, they would send heralds from town to town to proclaim the news, the good news, in the town square. See, when we hear the word good news and we think of salvation, we think of coming to know Jesus Christ as our Savior, and then somehow moving on to something else to share that good news with someone else. The gospel is about what Jesus has done for us in our place on the cross for our sin that makes it possible for us to know Him as Savior and Lord. But it is so much more than that. You see, the gospel is rooted in divine acts of intervention and substitution that give it the the reliability, promise, and power that it possesses. It's also about present redemptive realities. The gospel doesn't just define for you who God is and what he has done. It also redefines you who you are as his child. Again, we have the tendency to think we somehow graduate out of the gospel after coming to know him as our Lord and Savior, after conversion. But the gospel is deep and wide. The gospel is the continuum for us throughout our faith journey. The gospel is not just the diving board off which we jump into the pool of Christianity. The gospel is the pool itself. The gospel is not just the ABCs of Christianity, but it is the A through Z. You see, all of the Christian life flows from the good news of what Jesus has done. That's why growth in Christ is never going beyond the gospel, but it's going deeper into the gospel. You see, the gospel is meant to be a new set of glasses for every believer to wear and look at life. The gospel of Jesus Christ is meant to be your life hermeneutic. In other words, the the means by which you understand and make sense of life. From the moment you come to know him, you grow in that gospel, and everything you do, you see through the lens of the gospel itself. Now, as we look into our passage today, I want you to think of the gospel within the framework of three key realities, a framework for the gospel. Three key words, and they're this, save, shape, Share. Save, shape, and share. The gospel is definitely what saves you. But the gospel also shapes you. And God uses us as believers to, with the gospel to help shape each other. And we're to share that gospel so others can join us on that journey as well. Now in your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 1 with me. We're going to be looking at the book of Romans for the gospel because the book of Romans can be called the explanation. In the book of Romans is where the gospel of Jesus Christ gets unpacked and explained for its meaning, purpose, and implications. So Romans chapter 1, here's what Paul says beginning in verse 14. Paul says this, I am under obligation to both Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish, So I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Our first reality of the gospel is the word save. The historical facts of divine acts of Jesus through his intervention and substitution is what saves you. However, it happens because of Jesus' intervention into your life. It's that point you finally realize you're a sinner who needs a Savior because you cannot save yourself. You finally see Jesus' substitution in your place on the cross for your sin to be your Savior, and you put all your faith, 
all of your hope and all of your trust in Him. You see, in that pool analogy, you get up there and you dive into that pool, which is the gospel, to begin growing and maturing to become more like Christ. Whatever once held you back when Jesus intervenes into your life, you jump in or dive in and you're ready to go. And once you experience it, you love it and you're going to enjoy it and grow in it. Now, practically speaking for myself in this pool analogy, I spent a large portion of my childhood not swimming, not diving because I was not exposed to it very much and I was a little bit afraid. But once I got over my fears and was able to get up on the diving board, the first one I had to swim, get on the diving board, I started swimming, started diving. I loved it. I never quit. When Jesus intervenes into our lives, we finally get to the point of jumping into this pool, which is the prompting of the Holy Spirit. We jump in that pool, and we continue growing and enjoying Him and the gospel from there on. You see, for Paul, that happened on the Damascus Road. Before Christ, Paul was all about the law. He was about ridding the world of Christianity and Jesus. He was on that Damascus Road on his way to persecute Christians, and Jesus intervenes. Jesus jumps into his life. Paul's life-altering experience came on that Damascus Road while he was going on his way to persecute more Christians. The gospel, Jesus, that good news radically changed the whole trajectory of his life on that day from persecuting Christians to being a Christian and from ridding the world of Jesus to receiving Jesus. When Jesus saves you by the power of the gospel, you're radically transformed. You think and act totally different from what you used to or would without Jesus. You are at that moment forever changed. How could you not be that way because God has taken you from death to life? How could you not be that way because you are at that point a brand new creation in Christ? Now for a moment, what does that look like? Well, it's like this. Where you used to enjoy fellowship with the world, you now enjoy fellowship with Christ and the church. Where you used to walk in darkness, you now walk in light. Where you used to ignore your sin, you now admit and confess your sin. Where you used to be ignorant or of a careless attitude about God's word, you are now obedient to God's word. You love God's word. Where you used to love the world, you now love God. Where your life used to be all about you, it is now all about Christ. Does that describe you? When you experience the saving grace of the gospel, this becomes who you are. Now, does this describe you? It most definitely described Paul, and it was obvious. Paul was saved on that Damascus road, which then led him to being called by God to be his messenger to the Gentiles, which leads to the second reality of the gospel called shape. After we experience the saving reality of the gospel, we realize the shaping reality of the gospel, which is, which is ongoing. Because he has been saved by the gospel, now he's being shaped by that same gospel. His entire life with his dreams, goals, values, thoughts, words, actions, they're all continually being transformed and shaped by the gospel. The personal shaping of the gospel within us to a public shaping of each other. God begins to shape us into what he wants us to be as his new creation. As that clay on the potter's wheel. As us being in the hands of God being made brand new. We, he begins to shape us and then out of that we begin to shape one another. God shapes us to shape each other as he is shaping us. Look at verse 15 again. Paul says this, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Now when Paul says he is eager to preach the gospel to those who are in Rome, he's speaking to Roman Christians. They were the believers in Rome who had been saved by the gospel. And now Paul says, I'm eager for God to use me to shape you into more Christ-likeness, that we can shape one another. Paul is bringing the gospel to them to shape them. The gospel is the ongoing work of teaching and discipleship. 
that builds on the initial evangelism that comes into our life. Paul was wanting to pour into them because the way we live together in our churches grows out of what we believe together. You see, the shaping of the gospel is so we will release the boldness and passion God has put inside of us. A church is us as believers together drawing life from Him in regular, practical, organized ways that accelerate our progress for Him. That's that shaping process of the gospel. Look at Paul's reactions here in reference to the gospel. Paul says, I'm under obligation. Paul then says, I'm eager to preach. Paul says, I am not ashamed. So why is Paul obligated? Why is Paul eager and why is he not ashamed? This gospel that saved Paul, that is an ongoing shaping within him, is now something that he must, he has to share. Thus, our third reality of the gospel, that word, share. As God has saved us in the gospel, as God is shaping us in that same gospel, as we're shaping others, we see the need that we must share that same gospel with others around us. When Paul says, I'm under obligation in verse 14, the word he uses here is is debtor. Paul has never met them in Rome. So how could he be under obligation and be indebted to them? Well, there's two ways you can be in debt. First way is you can actually owe someone money, or second way is you can be given money for someone else. Let's say you work for a nonprofit, and you were handed a huge donation. And when that donation came into your hands, you hesitate. You don't hand it off right away. What do you think people would think if you decided that you would just stash that money away for a while? Truth is, that's not your money. And you owe it to others to share. That's why it was given to you. That's the very reason it was given to you. That makes you a debtor to these people. Now, That second definition is exactly what God tells us about the gospel message. We are not worthy of it, but God has blessed us with it. And with the privilege of hearing the gospel, receiving the gospel, comes the responsibility of spreading the gospel. For you and I, like that deading illustration, to not share it is stealing. By receiving it, we're obligated to share it. We must share it because we are now debtors to that gospel. We're to share this with others. When you and I realize we're obligated, and we feel obligated, we must make us eager and not ashamed. When that obligation comes into our lives and it drives us, when we feel that, that makes us eager to share it as soon as we can, as much as we can, and we are definitely not ashamed of it. All of this is driven by the real point of this entire section in verse 16. Verse 16 says, once again, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it, the gospel, is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now the word translated ashamed here means disgraced or personally humiliated. A person ashamed in this way is like someone singled out for misplacing his confidence. A person who trusted in something and that something let him down. The word can refer to being dishonored because of forming the wrong alliances. So when Paul says he is not ashamed of the gospel... He is saying his confidence in the gospel is legitimate and definitely not misplaced. He's saying this gospel that I've received that I'm passing to you, I am definitely not ashamed of this because my confidence in this gospel is not misplaced. It's in the right place. It is legitimate and it is on target. I have confidence in this gospel because of what it's done in my life, what I know it is and I know the person it is. Paul describes the gospel 
the good news as the power of God. That word power is where we get our word dynamite. But because you know TNT has such a negative connotation, it might be better to use the word dynamic for the gospel. That realized power, the dynamic of the gospel is what drives all of this. It drives Paul to be obligated and eager and thus not ashamed. He sees the power working in that gospel in his life and the life of others. You see, the gospel is the power of God. It starts with God. It ends with God. It's all about God. The gospel is all about God himself, Jesus Christ. Too often, we can regard God's power as an added ingredient that turbocharges our own efforts, that helps us do what we want to do. That is a wrong approach. You know, the early church definitely did not think this way. They thought of God's power as a miraculous intervention without which they were dead in the water. Now, this is so important because there's something we must understand. When it comes to the gospel, we must understand this. Without the good news of the gospel, without the power that is the gospel, there can be no salvation, no freedom from sin, no redemption, and no life. It all begins and ends with God. Now in Romans 1.17, we see why the gospel is this power of God. Why is it described as dynamite or the dynamic of God? Look at verse 17 again. He says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. It says here the righteousness of God is revealed. Key word. The reason it is revealed is because it is what we call an alien righteousness. It is totally outside of us. It is a righteousness that originates with God is revealed to us in the gospel by God through Jesus and offered to us through the sacrifice of Jesus in our place on the cross for our sin. You see, it is not something that we know naturally or that we can find ourselves. Unless God makes it known to you, you will never discover it. When Paul says it is revealed from faith for faith, that means we do receive it and believe it by faith. Now, in other translations, it says, by faith from first to last, or from start to finish, by faith. Now, but while faith, believing and receiving is a human activity, even that is from God himself. The entire revelation process of the gospel is all about God. It means that salvation comes from God's faith or God's faithfulness to our faith. God initiates, God intervenes, God works in your life to bring you to the point of even initially receiving that gospel. Then God works in your life continually through that gospel throughout your life. Salvation is accomplished through God's faithfulness, which comes first, and our faith in response to that. See, righteousness is a complete and total work of God. We can be tempted to see righteousness as something that we can achieve by our own merits or actions. But the righteousness of God is different. It is a right standing before God that has nothing to do with human accomplishment or worth. It is received by faith. There's nothing we can do to deserve it or earn it. When you see the love of God revealed to you in this kind of dynamic, gifted righteousness through Jesus, responding to it in faith, is the obvious response. When you see the power of God revealed in the gospel, you can't help but live in the saving, shaping, and sharing aspects of it all. When you realize this, you're ready to receive and release the power of the gospel. When you have been gifted with something so powerful as the gospel, and you have witnessed that power in your life, your only response is to feel obligated, eager, and and unashamed to share it. You see, this gospel, 
this transforming, life-altering, powerful, good news of Jesus, that must be the taproot in your life where everything else comes from. Don't ignore God's intervening and initiating of the gospel to you. Open up your eyes and see where God is working in your life. Where is God putting himself into your pathway to let you see him, to reveal himself to you, to see your need for him in your life as your Savior and your Lord? Don't ignore God's intervening and God initiating the gospel to you. Don't put off God's invitation to receive his gift of this dynamic power of the gospel of Jesus being your Savior and your Lord. For every one of us, this gospel is what saves us. This gospel is what shapes us throughout our journey of our Christian life in Jesus, in God. And as we're shaped, we are compelled, we're obligated, we're eager, we're unashamed to share this with others around us, within the church. We help shape one another by this gospel, being very much involved in each other's lives, loving the fellowship of one another, enjoying studying God together, worshiping Him together, being together, shaping one another with that gospel in our lives together. Then we know that we're to share it. We know that we are debtors to this gospel. We've been given something so rich and so powerful, we must go forward sharing that with others. So embrace this today, if you will, please. Look at God's intervention in your life. God initiating the work of the gospel in your life. Respond to that. Receive the saving power of that gospel in your life done for Jesus in your place. Allow that gospel to shape you, to allow you then to shape others. Take that gospel and share it, knowing this gospel is the power of God in your life to be used by you to point others to him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray this day, enlighten our hearts. Open our eyes, open our minds, open our ears to the gospel. Help us, Father, to hear your voice in ways we have never heard before. Help us to understand your thoughts, your word in ways we never have before. Help us, Father, to see you in ways we've never seen you before. To see you intervening in our lives, inviting us to know you. Help us to respond today. And God, help us to respond as you being our Savior and respond to you being our Lord, who's in control of our lives, that we surrender, submit to for everything. Knowing that this gospel is your power that works in us. Let that power transform us. Transform us into people who are eager and unashamed and obligated to share with others around us. So, Father, have your way in us today, we pray. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us today to begin our new series called Rooted. The things of our spiritual lives that we need to be rooted in, rooted in Christ. Today we talked about that taproot of the gospel. The gospel drives everything else in our lives. The gospel saves us, the gospel shapes us, and we're to share that gospel with others. So this week, in this period of time in front of you, ahead, let the gospel shape you. Share that gospel. And most importantly of all, let the gospel save you. Be known as, as a believer in Jesus Christ. Be blessed, ground, be grounded in the gospel. We'll see you next Sunday for part two of Rooted. Mm-hmm.